Cheers. So, hi, I'm Tom, I'm New Research at Oxford. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about amortized Monte Carlo integration. Uh, this is a paper we just presented at ICML, it actually got a run up uh, for best paper. And it's a collaboration with my PhD student, Adam Galinsky, and also Frank Wood from UBC. So this talk is going to be all about calculating expectations. So we're going to have some expectation of some function f of x, which might have some parameters theta, and some, just some distribution p of x, which might have some parameters y. So this is something that's really ubiquitous to pretty much everything. I mean, it's equivalent to calculating an, an integral, so it's pretty much all of the science, all engineering, pretty much everything. So it's a really ubiquitous problem that we're trying to sort of do, and we're trying to go right to the core of how to do that. More specifically, though, we're going to be caring about cases where we maybe can't easily draw samples from that distribution. So we can't just sort of do a conventional Monte Carlo submit where we draw samples from the distribution and take their empirical average. Um, maybe we only know up to a normalizing constant. And so we have a much more computationally difficult problem to do that. Moreover, we're going to be interested in cases where we're not just maybe calculating one expectation. We might care about lots of different expectations. So maybe this Y is sort of a data set. Maybe we're running a machine learning algorithm. Each time we give it a new data set, we have a new problem to solve. And rather than solving one problem at a time, we want to start by saying, let's solve all of those problems. Let's learn, say, like a neural network that gives us lots of things to help out with all those separate problems up front. And then when you start giving me a particular problem, I'm already well prepared to solve that problem. OK. So let's first by thinking about why, why do we often have these kind of problems when we don't know this, this distribution, when we can't directly sample from it? Why do these things occur? So the sort of canonical example here is a Bayesian inference problem. So in a Bayesian pipeline, we start by defining a distribution over some variables of interest. So if we call them x, we'll define a prior, some prior information, our prior expertise about those variables before we see any data. Next, we define something called a likelihood function. That likelihood function gives us a distribution of possible data we might see given a particular instance of the variables of interest. So it's p of y given x. The next thing we're going to do, we're going to input the actual data. We're going to give this the data we actually see and condition on actually observing that. We're going to go through some computation. We're going to go run some sort of inference method. And this kind of this step of the pipeline is going to be very related to what we're going to do in this talk. And eventually, we're going to get out something called a posterior, the updated belief about these variables we cared about x, given that we observed these distributions y. So what have we done here? We've combined some ex information from prior expertise with information from data. We put the two together and got an updated model that incorporates both of those bits of information. So why does that relate, though, to the previous slide? Well, this posterior is proportional to the prior times the likelihood. We don't know it exactly. We can't immediately draw samples from it but we do know it up to a normalizing constant. So this is a classic example. It's a huge area of machine learning where we've got these sort of expectations we're going to care about that with respect to some distribution we don't know exactly. So to give you a, an interesting example of this, imagine we're trying to predict flaws in deep sea oil pipes. We can't just sort of go down, pick those pipes up, look at them, say, have they got a flaw, because they're deep under the sea. What we're going to do instead, we're going to make some sort of deep sea submersible, send it down, let it take a few x-rays at different angles. And from those x-rays, we want to predict, is there flaws in that pipe? What is the kind of geometry of that pipe? Has it got really thin? Is it going to break? So this is a scenario where we have really strong prior information. We know a lot about what pipes we might see. We have experts who know about how pipes corrode. They write simulators for us. If we run those simulators, they'll give us geometries of pipes. So effectively, this is doing a distribution over pipe geometries. It's giving us a prior over possible pipes we might see. Furthermore, we know a lot about first principles physics. So if I give you a pipe geometry, I can then go and run simulations using sort of photon scattering, ray tracing, and these things to generate possible x-rays and images you'll see if you take an x-ray of that pipe. So together, these are giving us this forward model. They're allowing us to generate possible sets of images. And we have really rich information guiding well why and how these things get generated. And so this Bayesian inference framework is inverting this. It's basically saying, given we're getting this sort of set of images out of it, what are the geometries that led to it? We're running this in reverse. But to do this, we've got to get around this normalizing constant that we had on this slide here. Sorry. Uh, sorry. Um, and so, in particular, we might then 
care about expectations with respect to that distribution. So if I, as I said before, we care about the sort of probability this pipe is going to fail. And that's an expectation. That's an expectation under possible geometries of pipes we might see of sort of a failure function. So here we have an expectation, and this is a distribution of possible geometries given the x-rays we saw. And this is sort of a, a function that tells us if the pipe's going to fail. So if we want to talk about and reason about if that pipe's going to fail, we have an expectation with respect to some sort of distribution we only know up to this normalizing constant of some sort of target function. So this just gives you an example of the kind of expectations we might have in this general framework. So to just give you a very quick run through of the sort of what we're going to be going through in this talk, the key thing is going to be that most methods for doing these kind of expectations work in a very particular way. They first approximate this posterior. They approximate P of X given Y. And then once they've approximated it, they use that expert approximation to estimate the expectation. So they have this two-stage process. They think about running Bayesian inference, figuring out the posterior, but not necessarily thinking about how that posterior is going to be used. And that's actually really inefficient. If we know the sort of functions we're going to do expectations with up front, we can do a lot better by using information from that function, not sort of treating it as a black box that we're going to deal with later. And so in this paper, we're going to be talking about this thing, amortized Montour Carl integration, or AMPSI short. And what it's going to do is it's going to target these expectations directly. It's going to do clever ways of directly thinking about how can we calculate expectations rather than thinking about approximating posteriors and then using those approximations to calculate expectations. Moreover, we're going to do something called amortization. We're not just going to think about solving one expectation. We're going to think about how we can solve lots of different expectations. We're going to think about how can we learn stuff that sort of learns about taking data and function parameters and give us everything we need to very quickly give us answers to this expectation problem. So maybe amortizing over possible data sets, over possible expectations we care about. We want to learn about all of these up front and when we've got time before the deep sea submersible gets sent down and has to do this thing quickly. And in fact, we're going to have massive gains by doing this. So um, in red here at the top is the kind of conventional way of doing this. If we, if we successfully get exactly the posterior, we exactly do our Bayesian inference, and then we use that to calculate an expectation for the problem that's in question here, we'll get this red line. So here's sort of increasing a number of samples on a log scale. Here's a log uh, error. And we see that we do really poorly if we just get the posterior. Moreover, there's actually a theoretical limit. No matter how well we do, we can never beat that dash back line with conventional methods. MCMC methods, important sampling, variation inference, they're never going to get you past that dotted black line. So it's a real fundamental limit. It's not just sort of a theoretical abstraction. You really can't pass that limit by normal methods. What we're going to do is we're going to take as multiple orders of magnitude below this. In fact, we're going to be able to go arbitrarily low. We're going to break that bound. And we're going to remove this low bound and how we can do that. OK, so that was a bit of a whirlwind. Let's take a step back and start going through things a bit more carefully. So again, we're talking about expectations. And I'm going to start by talking about important sampling. But a lot of the things I talk about will still apply to, say, MCMC methods and various other things. Imagine now we've got an expectation of some function of f under a distribution pi of x. And we, for now, we're going to presume we do know pi exactly. We, can, we have the density. It's a proper probability distribution. We can evaluate it. Uh, but we might not be able to draw samples from it. And if we can't draw samples from it, it's going to be difficult to evaluate this expectation. Even if we can draw samples from it, it may be very high variance just to draw from it and take this sort of empirical estimate. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to introduce something called a proposal, which I'm going to be calling Q of X throughout. And we're going to draw samples from this proposal distribution and then weight those samples. So we're going to kind of sample for something else, then apply these sort of weights that are kind of like correction factors to bring us back to as if we'd drawn samples from the distribution we cared about. And then what we can do is we can take this sort of empirical average of these weighted samples. So instead of having the average of just the samples, we have an average of the samples times those weights to correct us back to the right distribution. And this has some nice properties. It's an unbiased estimator. This, this mu hat that we're generating in expectation, if we do this again and again and again, on average, it will give us exactly the correct answer. It also follows the, uh, what's known as the law of large numbers, which means that the variance of the estimator scales as the sort of variance of the function 
over the number of samples. So as we take more samples, we do better and better with this. And for what we're going to come later, there's also a really important property of this important sampling way of doing expectations, which is in very particular settings, it's exact. And to go through that a bit more carefully, if the function is always positive, and we have this proposal that's proportional to the distribution our expectations are respect to times the target function, even if we take a single sample, we're actually going to get exactly the right answer. And that's a kind of a bit magic, because it says if we've got this distribution that we draw a sample from, we suddenly exactly get this. We exactly calculate any integral, any expectation we might have. And so to see why that is, we have to think about what that optimal proposal really is. So the optimal proposal we said is proportional to the target times a function. But what's its normalizing constant? Well, its normalizing constant is actually the truth. And you might start to see where we're going here. So if the, the optimal proposal is q, uh, sorry, is pi times f over this expectation, and then we had from before that our sort of important sampling estimate was this empirical average of, the, uh, of pi times f over q, if we plug this particular q in, we're going to get pi f, the truth, over pi f. These guys are going to cancel. And we're going to get the truth no matter how many samples we use. So if we have this particular setting, and we emphasize that f has to be positive, and we have to have this perfect proposal, then we're going to get exactly the truth. Obviously, this is a very particular setting, though. And usually, we're going to have to rely on other things if we actually want to do these expectations. So the usual thing we fall back on is something called self-normalizing, uh, or self-normalized important sampling. So imagine now we're doing an expectation with respect to a posterior. We no longer are able to evaluate this distribution. We don't know it exactly. We only know it up to a normalizing constant. And so we can't quite do what we did before. We couldn't evaluate that pi of x. But what we can say is that, well, this expectation under this posterior is a ratio of two expectations. It's the expectation of the prior of the target function times the likelihood over the normalizing function, the marginal likelihood. And then what we can do is, again, we're just going to draw our samples from some proposal, weight each of those samples, where these weights are now based on this sort of joint distribution that we can evaluate exactly. And then we're just going to take the normalized set of weights. We're going to take a, this, this sort of set of weights at the top, but we're going to normalize by these, some of these weights. So we kind of, we take all our weights, we divide them by the sum of those weights, so they sum to one, and then we have a set of weighted samples. So we... What we really care about is these function evaluations, and we're going to have this weighted sum of these function evaluations. And so now we can actually have a way of estimating this expectation without actually knowing this, this distribution exactly. We only have to know it up to an a normalizing constant. But unfortunately, this is going to give us quite a few problems. So uh, I'm going to step through this, but just to, to remember that we're doing an expectation, this function under some posterior p of x given y that we can't evaluate exactly. And we know that's the ratio of the expectation of the function times the likelihood under some distribution we do know, p of x, over this normalizing constant. And we're going to estimate this by sort of taking the set of weighted samples divided by the set of weights. So we might have our joint distribution, p of x and y, might look a bit like this blue line. We might have some target function that looks like this black line. And the product of these might look like the red line if we rescale everything. So uh, actually, this, this black line is going up very, very, very high. Uh, but just for visualization purposes, I, I've sort of brought it down. So, uh, so just to sort of have these as dotted lines, we're going to be trying to estimate effectively the integral of this function over the integral of the blue function. So we want the two integrals of these two guys. And the natural thing people usually do is say, well, let's sample from the posterior. We had this distribution we couldn't sample from. So let's introduce this proposal to give us a way of sampling from this distribution. Let's make it proportional to this, this joint, which means it's also proportional to posterior. If we do this, our weights are nice and stable. So if we look at the sort of the joint over the, the weight, we're going to get this sort of nice smooth function for those weights that we can deal with. But if instead we look at the weights times the target function values, this actually explodes. In fact, it goes to calculate it's about at the moon where this thing actually peaks and comes back down. And so if we look at this, it's not going to do very well. If we look back at what we were doing, we think about the fact that effectively we're separately calculating both of these expectations with the same set of samples. So the fact that the weights are stable at the bottom means that this is a good estimator for the denominator. 
but the fact that this in green is unstable means that we have a very bad estimator for the numerator. So we have something where we've only targeted posterior, we do bad at this other part because we only do well at one part. So the natural thing to say would be like, okay, instead let's maybe construct a proposal that's proportional now to sort of the, uh, the target function times the posterior. So we, we have something like th this orange that sort of tries to match this other thing. And this, this initially solves our problem. We now have our weights times our function evaluations. They're nice and stable. But now our weights themselves explode instead. So now by correcting to try and do well for this numerator, we suddenly we're no longer doing well at the denominator. We're struggling to do well for both of these at the same time. So these self-normalized important sampling methods, which are the basis on a lot of methods actually implicitly use, can't ever do well on both of these at the same time. In fact, they have a fundamental limit on how well they can do. Their error can never be better than one over the number of samples times this term, that's sort of a variance of the function itself. And no matter how well we do, we can never beat that. And you might say at this point, well, that's just a particular algorithm. Surely it's just sort of a limitation of that algorithm. Well, MCMC could never do better than this. Variation inference can never do better than this. Almost every existing method can never do better than this. This is a real sort of fundamental limit on most methods. We can't generally do better than that by just sort of learning that posterior and learning how to do things, even if we incorporate information from the function. It's not just a posterior approximation. It's this fundamental limit that we want to break. So the key thing of the paper is going to be how do we break this limit? How do we do things that actually start doing better than this sort of fundamental limit of approaches? And the key idea is that we use different proposals, multiple proposals for targeting different parts of the problem. So if you remember back to when I talked about important sampling without the self-normalization, that could be perfect. And the key is going to be what we're going to do is we're going to take a problem, we're going to split it into separate different chunks, and then we're going to target those separate chunks in different ways. And in each of those different ways, they can each be perfect. And then when we stitch them back together, the whole thing can suddenly be perfect, and we have something that can suddenly work extremely well. So let's start again where we had before. We had the self-normalization. We have this expectation of a function with respect to a posterior, where we can only estimate the posterior up to this normalizing constant. And we have that this is this unnormalized expectation over a normalizing constant. So firstly, the first thing we might say is, instead of introducing one proposal and using it for both the numerator and denominator, why not introduce two proposals and use the first proposal for the numerator and the second proposal for the denominator? Each of those can start being tailored to these separate problems. And we can take that forward even further. We can say, how about if we start truncating that function? So remembering back, we said important sampling can be perfect, but it can only be perfect if our function is always positive. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our overall function and split it into this f plus and f minus, where f plus is always positive and f minus is always negative. And so if we look at f plus minus f minus, we get the original function, but we can now split up our original expectation into the expectation of f plus, the expectation of f minus, and this normalizing constant. Now, each of these expectations is an expectation of a function that's strictly positive. The likelihood, by definition, is positive. f plus and f minus we've constructed to also be positive. And so these are individually things that we can do perfectly. We can construct important sampling estimators that, if we have good enough proposals, will be perfect for each of these things. And we can actually suddenly smash that barrier and do things that break the way normal methods can work. So to go into a bit more detail, let's think about these three terms that we're looking at. We had E2, we had this as a normalizing constant. E1 plus, which is the expectation of this positive truncation in an unnormalized form. And E1 minus, which is the expectation of the negative, of the negative function truncation uh, times the likelihood. So what we're going to do is we're going to separately estimate these. We're going to introduce a Q2 that's really well tailored to this expectation a Q1 plus that's really well tailored to this expectation, and a Q1 minus that's really tailored to this expectation. And each of these can be perfect. They can each be tailored to that individual problem. They can do really well in that by training this to be tailored to this, this to this, this to this. And then when we stitch them back together, we can certainly have something that's doing a lot better than we did before. By not having one set of samples for all of it, but by having a separate set of samples, we've broken that barrier. 
each of these has no limit on how well we can do. And this split and put back together has really given us this way of improving things. So a bit more formally, we have the following theorem, which is that if Q2 is proportional to posterior, Q1 plus is proportional to the positive truncation of our function times posterior. Q1 minus is proportional to F1 minus times the posterior. Then this estimate I've just introduced is an exact estimator if we only take a single sample from each. So if we can learn these really perfect proposals, draw one sample from this, one sample from this, one sample from this, put them back together, is exactly the answer. No matter what those samples are, it will always exactly give the answer. And that's a really powerful thing. Because imagine we're doing, say, like a control problem or uh, sort of some trading problem where we have kind of an expectation. We've got an ability to upfront spend some computation to learn how to do things. But when we come to that problem, we want to learn exactly how to do that on that thing immediately. We can do that. We've broken that barrier. We've suddenly got a way of doing things. But there's a massive caveat. We needed these perfect proposals. It's all very well say I can give you perfect answers if you give me perfect proposals, but what about the proposals? Well, sometimes we just have a lot of prior expertise. Like, we had a fundamental limit before, and the original saying, no matter how good a proposal you gave me, there was still a limit on how well you could do. And actually, there are plenty of cases where we know enough about the problem before we start to write a proposal that will let us break that barrier if we use this framework. Secondly, we might be able to sort of think about improving those proposals on the fly. So there's a lot of things called um, adaptive Monte Carlo methods that will use information from previous samples and iteratively learn to improve that proposal. And we can use those, and those should let us again break this barrier. But where I think the thing really comes into its own is when we learn everything up front, this amortized saying. So this, as I said at the start, this is a paper also about amortizing over different problems. And what we can say here is, imagine before we see any data, I have, have my model. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to learn a way to sort of almost functionally invert this model. Then when you give me any particular problem, I've already done all the work I need to do to very quickly give you that answer. And this is going to really come into its own here. Because before you did this sort of breaking up and doing things, you had a fundamental limit. No matter how much pre-training you did, you could never do better than that posterior. You could never do better than that sort of theoretical limit. No matter how well you did it, you're sort of learning how to do the problem before you saw it. But now suddenly, if you learn well enough, you can actually do it arbitrarily well because of that theorem before. So let's break that down a bit more carefully. So what we're really thinking about doing is we're learning sort of proposals that are kind of approximations of the posterior, but in a functional sense. They're not just a approximation of, of that particular posterior. They maybe use a neural network that takes in that particular data set and gives you the proposal for that particular problem. So we're learning across particular data sets. And so if we go back to sort of this example we were thinking about, where we were looking at these deep sea oil pipes, obviously we're going to see lots of different images. We're going to look at lots of different pipes. We're going to care about all of them. And before we even send our submersible down, we want to learn how to solve the problems we care about for all the things that submersible might do. And because what we're trying to do is an inversion problem, we've got this sort of simulator and the whole computational problem was inverting that simulator in the first place. We can just work with our simulator up front. We can put some sort of supercomputer down, do all our work before we send a submersible down. And then when the submersible gets its actual set of samples, and it's going to get lots of these, We've already done the work to give it this set of proposals in AMPSI to solve the problem quickly that mean we can very quickly give the answers we need. So there's lots of applications we can think about here, like control theory problem where we know all the control settings, we've, we've sort of pre-programmed the model that might be happening here, and before we start the system running, we want to learn all the things that might happen so that we can in really, really quickly react to anything that might actually occur in that system. And any of these scenarios where we have to act quickly, but we have time before the problem comes, we're going to be able to use this. And by breaking that theoretical barrier, we've done a big advantage. Uh, to give another example, the sort of the canonical example of how people use uh, um, a, this sort of amortized inference is uh, something called uh, variational autoencoders, where we're sort of simultaneously learning a model, for example, to pr sort of produce faces of celebrities. Uh, while sort of learning how to solve inference in that. So in this case, we're learning this amortized inference thing to help train this model in the first place that might go from some sort of features like uh, 
gender and has someone got a beard and things and can construct images from them. But we also need to sort of run inference between these. And so in this, you have an expectation that's been used to train the model, and you might be able to calculate that expectation very quickly by carefully figuring out how you do that inference model. OK, so let's think about how we might actually construct one of these sort of amortization artifacts that learns how to solve all these problems before we actually see them. So generally, in the conventional setting where we're only caring about approximating the posterior, what we want is we want some sort of proposal that well matches that posterior. So you might say take a KL divergence from our true posterior to our variables of interest. So we want to make sure that all, uh, for all sort of possible data we see, that we have a queue that's close to this posterior. And so what we can do is we construct some sort of variation objective. We can say, well, what possible data might we see? Well, our model actually tells us a way of generating data. We can take an expectation over our model for possible data sets we might see. And then we effectively have this sort of variational objective that we can optimize to tune these parameters of this queue, say using a neural network, maybe with some normalizing flows and stuff, that helps us learn how to approximate this for different possible Ys. And the key here is because we're taking expectation over the Ys of our model, we're sort of taking that expectation of a possible data we might see before we ever actually see any of it. So with a bit of working around, this turns out to be a very easy, um, tractable thing. It's the expectation uh, under our model of this minus log density of our estimator. And this is something you can just sort of train stochastic gradient descent. You can just get up TensorFlow or something. You can very easily train this. You construct the right network, and you can just learn how to do this for a particular model just by drawing samples from the model and making updates to this. So this is how we're going to do it if we are only trying to approximate the posterior. But as we said before, we're looking at doing this more general thing of learning these multiple things. So if you remember, we had these three expectations. We broke down this overall problem of any expectation, any integral, can actually be broken down into these three terms. And now we need to learn a proposal for each of these three terms. So for the first term, for this E2 at the top, we see that that's just a margin like that actually is the conventional inference amortization problem. So we can just use these standard amortization objectives, the ones I've just showed you. We can already use those for that. The Q1 plus and Q1 minus, we start to think, what is the optimal proposal? If we go all the way back to the start and we spoke about important sampling, the optimal proposal was proportional to the target function times the distribution. So here we want that Q1 plus is proportional to F1 plus times the joint. And so this is the objective we want for this. But now we might also think about, hang on, we don't just care about amortizing over these data sets. Maybe we have lots of different functions as well. Maybe we're doing like a tail integral and we care about different sets of tail integrals. Maybe we have different problems we're trying to do. So we can also amortize over these functions we might see. So we, beforehand, we don't only learn how to calculate an expectation over different possible um, distributions. We can think about how can I learn an expectation for different functions and different expectations at the same time. And to do that, we're going to introduce uh, something we call a pseudo price. We introduce a distribution over the parameters of the function itself, and now we can use that to construct a, a thing. And so this is going to be a, a slightly more technical side, I'm afraid. Um, unfortunately, doing this creates a few complications. So let's. So for E1, um, we care about. We're just going to for now presume the function is positive. So we're just going to solve about talk about fx. So we're trying to calculate the expectation of the function times the likelihood. And the optimal proposal for this is um, the function times the joint distribution over the normalizing constant, which happens to be the truth. If we just set this up as we did before, effectively, if we replace our old posterior by this distribution that we now care about, we now want the Q that's proportional to this, then it turns out we actually get a double intractability. Um, so namely, we get the integral over all the possible x's, where we get this numerator term that's the actual truth we have. So it turns out there's this big technical issue if we just sort of naively sort of try and train it in the same way for each of these separate things. So we have to actually introduce a bit of a trick. Um, and I think I'm not going to go into too much detail on this. But basically, what we say is that instead of taking an expectation over the possible data we might see, we're going to take an expectation proportional to the data we might see times its value. So uh, for those of you who sort of 
uh, familiar with loss functions, we're effectively going from a, a two-norm loss to a one-norm loss. And we basically now say that we care about the expectation under this h, which is proportional to the distribution over data times its expectation value of the KL divergence. And this guy turns out to be, have this nice tractable form that lets us train these other networks. OK, let's now finish by going through some, some sort of example experiments. So we're just going to consider something really simple. We have our prior is just a Gaussian. It's a standard unit Gaussian. Our um, likelihood function is a Gaussian about, uh, about x. And our function is a tail integral. So we've got something like here where in um, purple is the posterior. Uh, we have this tail integral. So if we rescale it, it looks like this, this green. So we just got sort of a, a Gaussian. We, we care about what is the tail integral of that Gaussian. So it's a nice, simple problem where we know the analytic ground truth. And we can therefore sort of work out things. So this is actually the thing that gave us the plot I was giving before. So in red is actually sampling from exactly the posterior of that Gaussian and trying to calculate uh, tail integrals if you sample from the posterior defined by this sort of simple Gaussian problem. And as you can see, it does really terribly. E even if we take 10,000 samples, we get basically no reduction in our error. And even at the best, we get very little. Moreover, we see that for this problem, we can actually, e again, easily analytically calculate this theoretical bound of how well we could do with the best possible ever important sample. We can have the perfect possible proposal, and we do everything we can, but we're still only going to use one proposal. We never can get better than this. And uh, using our approach, uh, empirically, we're getting down to this blue line. So what we've done with this is we set up um, one of these amortization intersects using a neural network and a, a number of normalizing flows We've trained to these objectives. We've trained before we've seen any possible data. And then we've learned some network that once we give that network an observation, and in this case, a parameter of uh, the function, which is the point we want to calculate the tail integral at, when we give them that, then we calculate the estimates. We can immediately, even with the free samples, get these really low errors. And we still can improve by doing more. Um, to give a more sort of. Uh, sort of real world example of how we might be able to use this. Uh, we have a, a, a cancer treatment planning example. Uh, so in this example, we have uh, a physician, and that physician wants to say, um, should I basically be giving chemo to a patient? And that he has access to sort of two noisy observations of um, a tumor size about a week apart. And he also has a simulator for how tumors evolve. And he wants to use those two observations for the tumor size to say, if I do this chemo for this three month period, at the end of that three month period, will the tumor be small enough to operate on? And so what we want to really care about is, what's the expectation of the probability, well, what is the probability that the tumor falls below a sufficiently small threshold that I'll be able to operate? What's the probability I can operate on the, this patient in the future if I run chemo? Because if that probability is too low, it's not worth me actually running chemo. And so here we have something where we have a, a model that's based on these two observations we have and the simulator for how things evolve. And we also have a function that's going to evaluate how this evolves in the future. So together, these are giving this, this sort of combined problem of calculating this expectation with respect to an unknown posterior. We have to do inference to try and figure out what the starting size of that tumor is. And we have to run this function. We have to run the simulator to figure out what the final size of the tumor is through the expected final size of the tumor. And we can do this up front, because we're going to see a lot of patients. Different patients are going to have different observations. And rather than having to do this complicated analysis every time we see a new patient, we want to sort of learn to effectively invert the simulator, learn how to immediately predict everything from it. And so again, we find the same thing. As we, if we do this sort of traditional self normalized important sampling approach where we learn the posterior, we can never do really any better than this, this, this red line. We have this theoretical bound on any single sample approach that most things are currently based on. But with this AMSI approach, we can sort of, again, break this theoretical barrier and learn something that can almost instantaneously give us really good estimates for what this final tumor size will be. OK, so let's think, uh, finish by thinking about when does this sort of AMSI approach work well and when does it work badly? In short, it's going to work well when the discrepancy between the function and the posterior 
is very different to the posterior. So when there's a big discrepancy between two of these guys. So in this sort of tail integral example, these two are very, very different things because we go down into the, deep into the um, tail. And we see that the self norm is an important sampling that's very poorly relative to this AMC approach. On the flip side, it's not going to do so well if the two are very similar. So here we have something where the green is the function times the posterior, and it's very similar to just the posterior itself. And here the lines end up basically on top of each other. So in these cases where the function is almost flat, we're not going to get things. So what we're really saying here is that the less flat that function is, the more we're going to gain by doing this. And that kind of makes sense, because if we went back before, we had this ratio of two expectations. And if you remember, self norm is important something. We're using the same proposal for each of those. And by being restricted to the same proposal for each of those, if those two are very different, we're going to do very poorly by doing the same proposal. But if they're very similar, we can actually do quite well. In fact, we can actually do a much more sort of rigorous theoretical analysis of this. So what we can say is when the number of samples goes to infinity, so here k, n, and m were the number of samples for each of those three AMPSI estimators, then the estimator for AMPSI tends to this guy. Now, the first thing to realize here is that self norm is important something is an instance of AMPSI. It's an instance of this AMPSI framework where the proposal we're using is the same. So we can learn separate proposals, and if they just happen to be the same, we fall back to the self norm is important something framework. And so what we have here is E1, minus, E1 plus minus E1 minus. That's the true numerator. E2 is the true denominator. And then we have this additional term. And it basically, it's based on the central limit theorem where this, this kind of chi term is, is a unit Gaussian, is, has a module of unit Gaussian. And this sort of sigma 1 is a kind of one standard deviation. So this term is effectively telling you how good our estimator is for the numerator. And this is telling us how good our estimator is for the denominator. And even though these are marginally Gaussian, they're going to have a correlation. And so by doing this in this sort of relatively simple statistics, uh, if we define this value kappa, where kappa is this sigma 1, how good our numerator is doing, over sigma 2, how good our denominator is doing, times the actual truth, just to sort of do a dimensionality um, correction to make sure these have the same dimensionality, then we actually have the mean squared error goes at exactly the form shown here. And so it's a little complicated, but we can go through term by term. So this first term is sigma 2. It's how well we're doing at the denominator over its truth. And if you remember, when we did this conventional approach, we're trying to learn the posterior. And sigma 2 is how well we're doing at posterior approximation. So this first thing is just how difficult the problem is. It doesn't really relate to what method we use. It's just a measure of the difficulty of the problem. Kappa is a measure of how we're doing at the relative thing of the numerator and the denominator. And critically, that's fixed for self-normalized important sampling. So if you use the same proposal, a given problem, we have no control over how well we do at the relative things. But if we use different things, we can control this by sort of tailoring each of our proposals to separate problems. So what we see is we have these two terms. And for self-normalized important sampling, this kappa will basically explode if the um, F gets unflat. So if F times the posterior is very different to the posterior, that kappa will explode. It's fully dictated by the problem difficulty, and it's inherently going to explode. So this first term must explode for self-normalized important sampling. The second term is quite interesting, because the second term is also a correction where if these things are correlated, we get a sort of um, cancelling effect effectively. And so what it actually tells us is that self-normalized important sampling is better if this first term becomes negligible. So this first term will become negligible if the function becomes flat. So this kappa will tend to 1 if the function is flat. And as the less flat the function goes, it will tend to infinity. So the easier the problem is, the better the um, self-normalized important something is. And the harder the problem is, the more we're gaining by AMPSI. So effectively, we're just saying that we're gaining more the more difficult the problem is. OK, let's finish by just recapping. So we spoke about how to calculate expectations, and particular expectations of a different problem, of a different data sets and different functions, uh, and how we can do this when we don't know the distribution it's being the expectation is with respect to, except up to a normalizing constant, so like a Bayesian inference setting. And we spoke about how existing approaches to inference, and particular existing approaches to this amortization, 
only focus on learning this posterior. They only think about how do we learn this distribution of the expectation with respect to, rather than doing everything at once. And what I've talked about is this AMPSI algorithm where we're going to directly target those expectations and use information about the fact that we have this problem to break some of these theoretical barriers that we have. We're doing this, we're going to break down this expectation to separate parts, address each of these with separate proposals, and this is going to remove this sort of lower bound on how well we can do using these existing approaches. And they've shown that from a theoretical perspective at least, this has actually given us a means of getting a zero variance estimator if we can get good enough proposal distributions for any integration, any expectation. And that's quite a powerful thing, because if we can do enough learning up front for our problem, any problem you can give me, I can almost instantaneously give you an answer with enough training. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, my co authors so Adam, my student, and Frank uh, from University of British Columbia. And hopefully it's time for a few questions. Just wondering, I mean, in important sampling, you, you get infinite variance in the estimator? Sorry, I couldn't quite hear that. Sorry, so in, in important sampling, you, you potentially get, if you choose the wrong proposal, you, you get an estimator with infinite variance? Yeah. Um, obviously, if you have a perfect proposal, it, it's zero variance. Yeah. So how do you assess how well your amortized proposal, how, how perfect it is, if you like, how close to perfect? Because, I mean, if, if it's a long way away, you could have an estimator with infinite variance. Yeah, so the, 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 the key to a lot of this is basically what we're really saying is the better the proposal we can get, the better gain we can get. So, I mean, if it's infinite variance, everything will fail. And so if, if you've got an infinite variance proposal, it's pretty much useless in the first place. But what we're really saying here is the better proposal you can get, the more you can drive this kappa to one, and the more you can reduce the error with AMSI. Whereas if you just use a single proposal, there's a limit on how well you can do. So in terms of sort of assessing it, it's, you can use things like effective sample size and you can use these sort of conventional um, uh, metrics. And so, but at the end of the day, the, this sort of, the, uh, the actual amortized inference side is a sort of, there's a relatively well-established literature on how you learn a proposal for a target function. And if, uh, we're effectively just doing three separate tasks that are all one of those tasks. And so you can evaluate individually the success of those tasks, combine them like this, and you get a how well we're doing overall. So we're basically, we're always doing as well as the conventional approach. But we've removed the limit. And, but the, the applications are very much on the side of when you can get good proposals. If you're not getting good proposals, this is probably not going to be useful. I mean, if effective sample size is, is useful, right? But there's, there's no guarantee that... It, it doesn't give you a guarantee that you've got a good proposal. Fine. Sure. Uh, th there's no... But, I mean, that's kind of a massive open question on Carlin methods, that there is no universal way of knowing how good an important sampler is. So I think important sampling is way more... I, of all the methods that are out there, important sampling has definitely the best metrics for knowing how well you're doing. They're not perfect, but they're way better than like MCMC or variational inference where you really have no clue. Uh, you at least know it's unbiased. So the only thing that can go wrong is your variance. So we're not doing self-normalization. So the thing that usually goes wrong with effective sample size is the fact you're self-normalizing. And because we're doing non-self-normalized important samples, effective samples is actually very reliable. Uh, you, you can still have a skewness. You can still have a huge skewness but you can't have this usual bias where it's connecting to one mode and not connecting to the other. We actually don't have that problem. Thanks. Any more questions? No? Okay. So I have a question. Um, this E plus and E minus, is there a way to, like, um, can you connect that to these, this Gaussian example you showed? 
Like, what would the E plus be and what would the E minus be in sure. that example? Um, so, in this case, the function is just a truncation. So, there's no E minus is just zero. The, 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 so, we, we, we're effectively taking a function. Uh, I haven't, unfortunately, I haven't got an image for it, but you're kind of cutting it and taking the positive part and cutting it and taking the negative part. So, in this case, there's no negative part, so the E10 is actually zero. And then E1 plus is just the expectation of the numerator. So it's the, effectively, it's the integral of this green. Uh, so then the like, benefit comes from splitting up the numerator and denominator. Yeah, so, like, yeah, so th this, th this is actually a special case where we didn't need three. We only needed two. Um, but it's, yeah, it's just an easier one to explain. The, the, uh, the, the cancer one, you did, you did need all three. Else time. So let's thank Tom again. <laughs>